are in listen-only mode. Welcome to the January Community IT Innovators webinar series. Thank you for joining us today to learn more about IT security for nonprofits. My name is Johan Hammerstrom, and I'm the president and CEO of Community IT. We'd like to share a few webinar tips with you before we begin today. Uh, most importantly, we encourage you to interact with us by asking questions via the GoToWebinar question chat tool. We'd also like to remind you to avoid multitasking during the webinar. You may just miss the best part. If you do happen to miss the best part or you need to leave the webinar early, we'll be posting links to the recording and slides on our website, our YouTube channel, and our SlideShare account. In case you're not familiar with Community IT, our skilled and certified team of IT professionals serves the greater Washington nonprofit community, helping organizations of all sizes and capacities to advance their missions through the effective use of technology. We're deeply invested in the nonprofit community, have worked with over 900 nonprofits since 1993, and we take a strategic and collaborative approach that fits the unique needs and culture of nonprofit organizations. And now it's my pleasure to turn today's presentation over to our presenters, Matthew Eshelman and Steve Longenecker. They can introduce themselves. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks, Johan. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Matt Eshelman. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Community IT. Uh, and I was uh, just given a card by our HR manager that uh, I am going to be celebrating my 14th year at Community IT here uh, next week. Thanks, Matt. My name is Steve Longenecker, and I'm a Director IT Consulting at Community IT, and uh, I've been at Community IT 11 years. Great. Uh, well, thanks, everyone, for joining us today for this uh, pretty relevant topic as we talk about IT security. Uh, we have basically three parts to our uh, presentation today. We'll be talking first just about the overall threat landscape and, and what has changed in the world of uh, IT security. Uh, this has been an eye-opening uh, experience for me, uh, just you know, as I you know, continue to learn and understand the threats that are out there and that affect uh, organizations. So we'll spend some time uh, talking about the threat landscape, talking about kind of what's new uh, in cybercrime and uh, how that applies to the nonprofit community, uh, and then we'll wrap up uh, with some more information about kind of our community IT security playbook and how we work to improve the security uh, of the organizations that we work at. So as you uh, are all aware of, security is headline news. Uh, there's, you know, not a day goes by when we aren't getting some uh, new story uh, about a threat that was uh, uncovered, a uh, new attack that was uh, delivered, uh, or, you know, in a, a recent case, uh, you know, a, a company suing their insurance company because they didn't uh, follow up on their uh, cyber security insurance. So uh, security is, is headline news and is certainly uh, on the lips of you know, many people and, and kind of across the organization. Uh, the changes in security uh, reflect, I think, the broader changes in technology that we've all experienced. So uh, the changes in uh, software as a service, uh, you know, Office 365, Google Apps, you know, the advent of infrastructure as a service with Amazon, uh, you know, all of that uh, transformation in technology has, has not just been limited to uh, the positive things that we can use it for, but it's also led to a uh, model of you know, cybercrime as a service, meaning it's a, it's a lot easier for, uh, for criminals to uh, take advantage of, of weaknesses that are out there. So in the old, you know, in the old world, so to speak, uh, you know, you may have had a centralized uh, hacking organization uh, that had to build a lot of the tools from scratch. Uh, they had to have their own IT infrastructure. It was pretty expensive, uh, required capital investments in in all of those resources, uh, and because it was expensive to uh, to build, uh, in order to get a return on investment, those organizations needed to go after large targets. Uh, to get a return on that investment. So in the new world, uh, where we now have you know, infrastructure as a service and cybercrime as a service, uh, it's a lot different. It's, it's much more distributed. You can you know, buy different components to launch your attack and then specialize in certain areas of attack. And it's much cheaper, and you can be much more opportunistic 
uh, as a cyber criminal and targeting much more small, much smaller and more vulnerable companies. And so uh, today we're we're really seeing you know an entire ecosystem uh, around this kind of area of, of cyber crime. So along. So along with uh, you know cyber crime as a service, now there are uh, job postings. So there, if you're a cyber criminal looking uh, to get into business, uh, there's job postings that you can go to either uh, buy services or sell your own services. Uh, there are payment systems, you know, Bitcoin and other uh, cryptocurrencies that are untraceable, where you can uh, you know, have financial tra transactions. Uh, and then there's also marketplaces where as an anonymous vendor, you can go and uh, you know buy and sell your services. So you know technology is really a wonderful thing, uh, and it's also made it easier for uh, cybercrime to exist. So you know the result of this is that, um, as Matt was saying on that slide a little while ago, uh, when when cybercrime was a very expensive endeavor, you could you had to go after big targets where you could maybe get a make a killing when you when you committed your crime. Now that 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 cybercrime is something that's you know scales down because it's it's something that that uh, anyone can do relatively inexpensively. Um, it there's it makes sense in terms of the business model to target smaller targets. So um, we're definitely seeing um, much more attacks against small and medium businesses. And um, there's a, you know studies out. And we, we're citing one here from Semantic and another one here from Verizon that just indicates that uh, no longer are um, criminals targeting uh, very large enterprises. They don't have to. Um, and as a result of that, it's no longer true that um, that nonprofits can just sort of hide um, in the herd, so to speak. That um, you know, why would why would we be why would we be um, Hit by uh, by a hacking effort when we're just a small nonprofit and there's someone someone they could go after somebody else. Um, we wanted to uh, highlight um, a, a a report that just came out um, from Idealware. Um, uh, what nonprofits need to know about security. It was just published in the last couple of weeks. Um, the the link is there um, at the at the bottom of the of the quote. Um, and many hackers have discovered that nonprofits make good targets. Um, and uh, you can see the rest of the quote there. Um, which brings to another another um, notion that I wanted to speak about. What does it what does it mean to be a target if if we're talking about nonprofits being targeted? Um, you aren't targeted in the sense that a hacker has necessarily picked you out in some like targeting process where it's like, oh, I want to go after this nonprofit. Um, it's more that you're a victim of a crime of opportunity when these things happen. And, and I'm, thinking about this made me think about, this is, must have been almost 10 years ago now, but on the way home from community IT, um, a long time ago, on the way home from the metro to my house, it was in broad daylight, I was mugged. Um, and uh, it was a somewhat painful process, uh, uh, getting mugged. And that, um, but it wasn't personal. I didn't take it personally. I was walking home with headphones on, less aware than I than I wish I had been, particularly in hindsight. I, it wasn't like someone said, "I'm going after Steve Steve Longenecker here." I was, it was a totally a crime of opportunity. I, I completely believe that. So back to our story about crime as a service. Um, the take-home message is that technology has made it easier to be a cyber criminal. Even amateurs can do it. So crimes of opportunity are more common. There are more criminals out there. And so hiding in the herbs, herd still works in some sense, um, the number of, but the number of crimes uh, is occurring is, is on the increase. And so the likelihood of, the, of, of being hit, you know, even a mild-mannered nonprofit um, can get targeted. You know, the, and, and criminals aren't targeting you because of who you are. They're criminals because they're, they're attacking you because your network is, is out there. You have an IP address. You have computers that if they can exploit, they will. Yeah, and I think that's a, you know, a a good notion to understand is uh, the targeting is not again because of what your organization is or, or what you do, but but because of, of what you have. Um, and as we talk about you know what does a an attack look like, uh, you've 
you know, we're, we're using a lot of uh, research here from uh, one of our partner organizations that we work with is Op OpenDNS, and so they've done uh, a lot of kind of research and analytics into how these things work, uh, and so we're thankful for, you know, having, having that, you know, insight. So as we talk about uh, kind of the earliest stages of attack, this is some education that I think was, was helpful for me to just understand, you know, how, you know, antivirus is uh, and, and threats are different now uh, than they've been in the past. Uh, you know, we've I think evolved beyond uh, you know the the obvious you know attachments that that come in through through email. Uh, you know, we've moved beyond uh, you know some of the you know uh, you know bringing in something on a, a thumb drive. And now, uh, the attackers are much more finely tuned and finely tuned uh, to things that that kind of resonate with us as you know people doing doing business. So uh, here on your screen, you see uh, you know kind of a finely crafted email from from FedEx saying, "Hey, we failed to deliver a package. Uh, go ahead and print out this shipping label." Uh, and 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 it's in the act of clicking on a link that has a compromise uh, on a website that uh, that first stage of the attack can happen. Again. Hey, here's a really good-looking email, uh, voicemail message to attachment. You know, go ahead and, and with a prompt to action, and, and that initiates the compromise. And uh, so, you know, the the hackers I think are improving their uh, their approach, and so it's no longer a you know kind of a poorly worded email from a Nigerian prince that uh, is asking asking you to send money, but you know things that you would probably click on, like you know printing out a a link from a FedEx. So as we talk about uh, that step of, of um, you know compromise, then we're also seeing this new term of, or concept called malvertising, uh, and so malvertising, as the name might imply, is uh, kind of a combination of malware delivered through web ads. So web ads, uh, you know, we're all seeing them as you know content that's on sites and trusted sites, even like the New York Times, uh, South Carolina Times. Uh, where uh, cyber criminals would set up a website that has an exploit kit that would you know exploit some vulnerability in your web browser or add-ons, uh, and then they would just run that ad on a on a known good network. So Yahoo, AOL, you know any other ad company uh, would um, you know serve that ad up. Uh, the ad server redirects users to the exploit kit site, and then the user gets infected from there. So uh, so you know these these types of attacks would look something like this. So here we have an example of, uh, you know, here's an ad. Looks like an ordinary advertisement. Hey, bing. Um, oh, I'd, you know, I'd love to get $100 in, in free ads. And kind of unbeknownst to you uh, as an end user, there's there's nothing necessarily protecting you against clicking on that link. You know, this this is not a file that's being run on your computer, um, but it's, it's a compromise that is uh, being backed up by uh, a a compromised website that's exploiting a vulnerability uh, in your web browser or the add-in software. So again, we want to emphasize that um, this is not something that requires a huge investment from, from the folks that are out there looking for opportunities to um, infiltrate um, someone else's network. Um, you, you can do this very cheaply um, if you're a criminal in Eastern Europe with $200 in your pocket um, and a little incentive to earn more, you can you can buy these kits online. Um, Matt and I sort of were laughing about this when we were pre preparing it. You know, this is the there's three parts to this. There's you know the scare you part, and then there's the you know what can we do about it part. And another meta level discussion of this is, hey, if you, you know. You too can be a cyber criminal. Um, is uh, you know not the message we're trying to deliver here, but it really is that easy. Um, you, you just got to find sort of find your way to um, to the kits. And I think about like my son, who's you know managed to work out you know, every which way to play Minecraft because he's sort of gotten enveloped in that world, and that's great, and I'm happy for him. But like it's that it sort of works that way. I think with um, cyber criminality these days, if once you find your sort of your way into the beginning, you can get help from other people. And um, here we have a slide that um, you know just cracks us up, but it's it's real, it's scary. Um, you know, you can you buy this kit? Um, it's like a nice piece of software. It tells you you know what computers you've um, 
you've 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 gotten um, what kind of the computers are, which exploits are loaded onto which ones, which ones are using what browsers. I mean, this is sophisticated software, and again, because of the way software um, is manufactured, um, it it's uh, it's not ex it's not expensive. Yeah, so I think even better now. There's even advertising here. So here's a you know an an in in app advertisement for you know a, a new exploit that you could go ahead and click on and buy to you know expand your uh, cyber criminal enterprise. There you go. So once um, your computer is infected, then the next step is to um, is to deliver the malware to it. Um, so uh, getting getting sort of the computer um, into the into the Criminal portal portal is step one. Step two is then to uh, put your whatever you want to put on it. So there are different things that that we're seeing um, these days. Um, a common step, a term that we that you know we learned, I learned about um, for preparation for um, for this uh, presentation is is the is the dropper um, steps. So this is sort of an intermediate step. Um, it's the malware that um, basically is telling the computer, hey, check, you know, in addition to sort of doing all the things you're doing for, for the end user, unbeknownst to the end user, um, we want you to sort of check in on a regular basis, call home, so to speak, to the portal of the, of the cyber criminal. So there are people who don't really actually do anything bad, like they're not the ones stealing your password to the bank and taking the money out. Um, all they're doing is they're getting really good at sort of collecting, you know, huge collections of these um, of these computers. The malware just sits. The dropper malware just sits there quietly. It's not uh, flashy or anything. Um, then the the criminal then is selling this to um, this computer. Uh, to uh, you know, on their on their marketplaces, like, hey, I have I have you know 1,000 computers that are ready for you to to do whatever you want to, and um, and then um, they they sort of con contract that out. Any questions about this? Do we want to stop? For, are the questions now? We want to pause for. Um, the the one question that we have so far is about spear phishing that. Um, spear phishing, which is you know targeted um, email, you know attacks where the email mm -hmm. looks very legitimate. Yeah. Um, and actually, it's funny because our CFO received an an email, a PDF from someone pretending to be me yesterday, and it was so realistic looking that he sent me a text message to say, "Did you send this?" Um, so it it's happening kind of constantly, and and I know. We're not alone in you know in that happening. It's becoming kind of the new reality, um, and you know we have spam filtering obviously, but uh, spear phishing seems to keep getting better and making it past um, spam filters. Uh, m this might be a better question for the end when we talk about some of the solutions or approaches for dealing with mm -hmm. this. But mm -hmm. the question is is really you know are there yeah I right. mean are there ways to you know fortunately you know we're pretty tech savvy organization and our CFO is pretty diligent about and and you know his his antenna are always up as far as those things go not every executive at every organization is uh, going to be so mindful um, and obviously you know the more we can prevent them from seeing the email in the first place uh, the better right right yeah well let's we'll um, we'll talk about that when we get to the solution set um, it's an interesting a uh, piece of the uh, puzzle for sure. Um, so this slide um, just talks about is just sort of illustrating the fact that um, you know these these people that collect these fleet of you know the hosts of computers that all have their that are ready for um, for other malware to be added to it that they that they then ask pass along to other criminals who want to do the actual work um, you know they can get sometimes they can get so many that they have to do sales and you know sell it cheaper than they than they than they did before I, it's like it's like a it's a real you know it's a marketplace it's an enterprise um, it's it's business and it's and so uh, when when the incentives line up like this the idea that uh, 
nonprofits can you know continue to be safe from these activities. Uh, it's just not true anymore. Yeah, and I think that's a good transition into. Um, you know, I think combating some of the the responses that we often get with with talking about security to to nonprofit organizations that may think, well, you know, we don't really have necessarily any data that we're concerned about uh, getting out there, um, and so this is an illustration of some some recent e examples of of not, you know, not the big high profile you know Sony target threats that that are kind of over the top, but you know, one hundred sixty thousand dollars from a from a you know from a public library. Uh, you know, three hundred fifty thousand dollars from an elementary school as a part of you know these are real financial losses as a direct result of uh, kind of keyloggers and and other you know data you know kind of traffic sniffing software that's on the network uh, and the you know the the sad thing with these losses is that you know this is not something it's not like your personal account where you know the bank you know is going to maybe refund your money or make you whole again you know these are business losses that you know represent real lost dollars to those organizations so uh, this is you know example of, of direct kind of financial loss as a result of uh, as a result of a security breach uh, but then this you know we're not even talking about the time lost to you know the actual data downtime if you don't have access to your information uh, or you know that the data is no longer there. So again, you know even if you know your data is 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 you know free and and open to the world, uh, if you don't have access to that data, then it prevents your organization from you know doing you know kind of accomplishing your mission. So, uh, and that's what we see uh, a lot with you know the next slide in in kind of the world of of malware is is now it's you know ransomware. That's the new kind of one of the new things that's that's been around uh, and on the rise for the last few years. Yeah, so we assume that those like real financial losses are through probably keyloggers that that are you know put on put on computers um, once they've been compromised, and and then if your CFO or or anyone is you know at, at entering in credit card um, records or whatever, um, you can you can you know, that gets picked up and and stolen. A uh, ransomware. Um, that's this is probably the the I, I would say that in the last couple of years this is the one that we've seen impact our clients the most in terms of the most frequent um, that it's happened and then also the big or at least the biggest impact with the most frequency this ransomware um, there's a lot of different names for them crypto locker is the one that's uh, probably the the most common one that that gets thrown around um, but uh, the idea here is that um, that one machine on a network is infected one way or another, um, and then uh, it, you know, it gets an encryption key by phoning home to uh, the criminal headquarters, I guess, uh, and then it encrypts um, either the local uh, or network or both uh, network share data, and um, it's interesting. Like we've seen, I think I'd say Matt and I discussed this. I'd say we've seen this at. Mm, six to ten maybe more not much more but six to ten clients um, and oftentimes uh, so what happens the experience of the of the staff or the of the users of the network is hey I can't open my files anymore on network share what's going on and um, you know we get a help desk ticket and we quickly jump in and, and sometimes you can sort of catch this thing midway because it takes time to encrypt thousands and thousands of files and so and it generally just starts at the A's and works your way through so we'll like take the infected machine offline and we'll have like all the f all the folders that are, you know in the root of the file share that are like L through Z still good A through K nothing you can do they're completely encrypted with some you know key and uh, you get you know a message saying you know you have well let's go to the next slide here you know you have you know 48 hours to to send us uh, $2,000, and if you don't, you know we're going to throw away the key and you'll never get your files back again. And again, we've seen this at, um, at at clients that we that that we take care of, and it's not because um, our clients didn't have up-to-date antivirus definitions, um, or be, I don't I don't really wouldn't even say it's because anybody did anything wrong. It's it's because of how sophisticated um, cyber criminals have become. I mean, obviously somebody clicked on something that they shouldn't have, but 
Um, I don't think, you know, sort of blame the user is, is necessarily the lesson learned here. Um, the lesson in this case uh, for us, more than anything, is thank goodness you have good backups because that's basically the approach that we've taken to, to resolve it is just all these encrypted files are, are basically replaced by the last good backup, hopefully um, from not too long ago, and, um, and we're okay. Uh, that's, that's the best case scenario. Even with the best case scenario, you may not have access to those files for, you know, half a, for a day, hours, days, something like that, because it takes time to restore from, you know, again, just like it takes time to, to encrypt thousands of files, it takes time to restore thousands of files. Um, it's very disruptive. Um, it's scary. Um, while it's happening, uh, no one's having any fun. And it's reality. It's happening um, to our clients and not because, again, because necessarily people are doing anything wrong. Yeah, and I think, you know, this has been the case, you know, for a long time. You see this quote from International Data Corporation from 2011. So signature-based tools, antivirus, firewalls, intrusion prevention are only, you know, effective against 30 to 50 percent of security threats that are out there. Um, you know, and so I think the the bottom line, and even you know, vendors like Symantec have have acknowledged and publicly acknowledged that that yes, the the traditional signature based uh, virus detection tools and techniques just don't work anymore. Uh, you know, the the malicious actors are are far ahead of uh, the technology right now, and so there's really a race I think to to develop the next generation of solutions uh, that to protect uh, to protect us against that. Um, and here's an example of, of just why why it is so hard to do signature based detection. Yeah, so this is just a uh, these next two slides just show um, one of the other another one of the tools that are in the in the um, the toolbox of, of criminals. They have you can buy these uh, kits or packages that um, you can basically take your your malware um, that that maybe you know you didn't write yourself because after all that takes skills maybe you just got it online from somewhere and it's malware you want to use but if you try to deploy it um, all the people that are protected by antivirus block it which is no good for you so you s turn it into one of these um, cryptors they're called and the cryptor basically rehashes it all up so that it no longer is recognized by the by the current definitions and then you can send it out again and it will s sneak by and you've got these services that you can that can test against all the the best antivirus um, tools that are out there um, here's a, a, a slide from uh, you know a marketplace like hey buy this is the crypto package that's the best one to buy is the one that's 150 because it includes um, you know both products and you know unlimited premium support. Um, so it's it's a crazy world um, that's out there and and it's not a shock given the 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 degree to which it is so easy that we're we're seeing more and more of this at our clients. So with all of the you know scary news and I you know, I mean really really real threats that are out there uh, it's, I think it's easy to get disheartened and kind of throw up your hands and say, well, what, yeah, what, what can we do? And so we want to focus the remaining uh, part of the, the presentation and hopefully uh, have some questions and interactions with, with uh, you know, the attendees in terms of, okay, so what do we do? How do we prevent and contain these threats um, and, uh, you know, build off of, uh, I think, the very good report that Idealware the developed that you know talked about kind of the full life cycle and uh, how to develop uh, a, a kind of a good security uh, architecture and security approach. So we like to think of um, you know kind of these things as a security playbook, so to speak. And so in terms of how do we visually represent the you know a security playbook, uh, you know there's a lot of different rubrics that are that are out there are different diagrams and we felt that you know security is not necessarily just just a hierarchy but it it certainly builds off of uh, you know a foundation of, of, of people and, and security training and awareness so uh, there's lots of technology solutions out there but fundamentally uh, you know security training and awareness is going to be the key place to start so as with 
the spearfishing uh, attempts that we're seeing be, being very uh, active, um, you know, that's you know that's the foundation for uh, for how to uh, combat this. Yeah. So yeah, we we do emphasize the training and awareness. I think that that has to be what we what we start with, and we ourselves are talking about how we need to be able to do more training um, for our clients that are that ask for it. Um, you know, just making people aware of how common spear phishing is and how you know uh, this mal advertising um, techniques are now out there um, makes people more wary and more uh, sensitive to to you know when their antenna go up faster, and that's all for the best. Um, we put a quote there from Ben Franklin, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, we thought we think about that quote in the context of you know. Uh, if I get a suspicious email, um, you know, should I should I take the time to to ask the help desk or to text the sender or you know to do to do the extra steps I do before I just oh you know I know one way to find out if this is an exploit or not let's just click on it and then if something bad happens I'll know that I shouldn't have clicked on it um, and you know and that's a joke but I'm, we were talking about this at our engineers meeting on Tuesday and one of our senior engineers talked about the fact that you know seems to him anecdotally that there's more infections that happen at the end of the day um, than at the beginning when, you know, at the end of the day you're just trying to get through the, the email so you can get out the door and something comes in and it's like, now is not the time I want to stop and take the time to, to check on this. Um, I think the other message in terms of training and awareness that, you know, the, the, the big message, not, the, not, not in the detail level, but just the big picture message is that, that I think people have been uh, have wanted to rely on the technical safety nets. I can click on this because I have up-to-date antivirus, so it's going to be safe. It's going to work out. I can I can be um, I can be risky in my behavior because I can count on the technology to save me at the end of the day. And we want um, to train our staff that uh, they have to be partners in this, and that um, that it's a constant technical race between. Um, the criminals and the and the people who are trying to stop the criminals and definitely um, you can't count on tech, to always be ahead in that race. You can't count on that. Yeah, and as um, Steve Steve mentioned earlier, you know, kind of the the first response to often these uh, crypto attacks is actually backup. Uh, you know, antivirus is not going to detect the actual um, you know application that that's running. Uh, you know your file server may not detect it because the you know the the encryption is happening actually from a different computer and so the virus is not actually running on the file server uh, but it's running from somewhere else and so uh, you know the you know once you get your training and awareness um, kind of process in place you know the backup is is really the the next go to uh, system that that's going to restore that access because the information is is kind of the key asset for your organization and and having access to it is important so. We talk about backup, uh, a backup regimen with uh, appropriate recovery point objectives, which basically means how often uh, are you going to be backing up that data? Are you backing it up, you know, every hour, every four hours, every day, uh, and then how quickly can you get that data back? So recovery time objectives. So as Steve mentioned, uh, it takes a long time to encrypt a bunch of files, uh, and it can take a long time to recover a lot of files. So again, uh, if you have um, you know, maybe uh, a, lo a database server that, that has multiple databases uh, that you want to protect, uh, the recovery strategy may be to identify, you know, what are those applications that are the most important to our organization, and if we do have a security breach, okay, we know we're going to restore, you know, the finance database first, and then the HR system second, and, and, and so on down the line. But, uh, and so we're not talking about just backing up files. Files are important. Uh, we're also talking about email. Um, you know, databases, cloud data, uh, as well as on that on-prem data. And that was another thing just to highlight is just because uh, your data is in the cloud doesn't mean the backup policies, um, you know, that the vendor, your cloud vendor has, you know, meet, meet your requirements. So for Office 365, you know, for Salesforce, for Google, for all these different cloud vendors, uh, you know, they are doing some degree of data protection it's primarily geared to uh, protecting themselves in the event that they they suffer a failure. Uh, it's not necessarily geared to protect you know your organization if uh, certain files get compromised or encrypted. Uh, there's 
there's a recovery process that you can go through with those cloud vendors, um, but it's often going to be on a timeline that then it, then then is a lot that would be a lot slower than what you would like. So uh, there are lots of good uh, third-party backups that give you a lot more control and insight uh, into recovering uh, data from those systems. And just as uh, you know, anything you know, your own your backup is is only as good as your ability to restore from it. So uh, so the the cloud makes it a lot you know, easier to, to do those backups, uh, but then it's also important to, to do those tests so that you have confidence that, uh, you know, if there is a problem, you're going to be able to have access to the data uh, that you expect. So moving beyond backups now uh, into talking about patching, uh, you know, a lot of this is very uh, kind of boring. It's not, not very interesting to have, you know, a good uh, security training or a good backup system or, or patching. Uh, and uh, you know, this is a diagram is from uh, the IBM uh, X-Force Research and Development Report, and so their analysis of where application vulnerabilities are, are coming from is, uh, you know, Windows is, is certainly a portion of the vulnerability, uh, but there's a lot more vulnerabilities now that are targeting uh, other applications like Java, like Adobe, uh, or, you know, within the browser itself, and so, uh, you know, Patching Windows is just not enough anymore, uh, and so you need to be able to patch the Windows applications and then also third-party applications as well. And it is really hard; <laughs> it's hard work. Uh, we spend a lot of time and attention in uh, you know, patching Windows systems and reporting on that, and patching uh, you know, third-party applications and, and reporting and doing analytics on that. Uh, and you know. We, yeah, yes, if I could interrupt, we've gotten a lot better at it. With, I mean, in the last number of years, that we you do it, doing it almost exclusively now in a centralized management way, rather than you know, in the old days you would do it client by client, and now it's all done through our remote manage, remote monitoring and management tool. Um, so it's it's gotten we've gotten much better at it. But I'm sorry, I just wanted to. I just remembering the bad old days when it was. <laughs> Yeah, really? well, I mean, I think the, the highlight is, you know, often when we onboard a new client and we, you know, kind of get them into our system and we start doing the, you know, our patching and remediation, you know, even, you know, we, we see it more often than not that, you know, clients that, you know, we onboard are significantly out of date for patches uh, for Windows and then and then often third-party patches are, are, are way behind because it is really hard work and it takes a lot of care and attention to make sure that uh, those updates are being applied and especially with a lot of these threat kits like Angular that take advantage of uh, vulnerabilities in you know Adobe Flash uh, you know you have to be really uh, on top of it to make sure that all of those you know all those little annoying things that are in the bottom of your system tray that pop up and say hey there's an update uh, that those systems are in fact being updated because uh, that's where a lot of these uh, you know, malware advertising, uh, you know, systems take advantage of. Yeah, and I think that's go goes back to the to the training issue. You know, that helping s staff and users understand that that ducking uh, updates, which they want to do sometimes because it interrupts their workflow, um, and they get a pop up box that says, you know, hey, you need to update this software right now. It's like, well. You know, it would, that sounds like it might need, I might need to restart my computer. I don't have time for that right now, so I'm going to say no. And there's legitimacy to that choice, but I, I certainly have worked with um, client uh, users who, who do that for a long time um, before finally someone like me comes up and says, you really need to do this today. Um, it's, it's gone on long enough, but anyway. Um, Another slide here on another part of the puzzle. So again, um, it's not like there's any magic, one single magic bullet in our bag of, of uh, tools for uh, security. Um, each of these is important and fits and together makes, makes the complete puzzle, but passwords are, are obviously critical. Um, so people have asked us, you know, specifically, you know, what, what, what is your recommendation um, for password policies and um, you know, we we find that you have to sort of the the ante has been upped um, over the years. As dictionary attacks have become, you know, the, the processing power behind them has become um, faster and stronger. And so, you know, uh, it does. We're we're now saying that uh, ideally you would have uh, eight characters in your passwords, um, six for mobile devices, um, ten for administrator and privileged 
IDs. They should be, you know, complex, um, meaning they should have numbers and symbols. This is, you know, capital and lowercase letters. This is not new to anybody, um, but it's it is it is real that um, that it's becoming. Um, and it, it is an issue that you can't that you can't avoid. Um, you know, there's there's nice advice about how um, you can use pass phrases instead of actual passwords. So just a, if if you have um, like password management software that creates uh, random passwords for you, that it's impossible. To, those are those are they met, they meet all the the requirements, but if you look at them, it's like how I would never be able to remember this. I have to write this down on a sticky note and paste it to my monitor. Um, you know, instead you can if you use a passphrase uh, that you know even might even have spaces in it or you know some some symbols and things in there. It's easier it's easier to remember. Um, changing it frequently is is a pain point for 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 clients. We have clients who have um, who have said, you know, we really aren't willing to do this um, because of what what it does to our staff, especially remote staff, who who's if their domain password changes and then they don't have an easy way to keep up with the change. But it really is important um, because the if you don't change your password frequently, um, it's just too easy uh, for it to become. You know, if it ever gets compromised, um, it it uh, um, it's it doesn't ch if it never changes um, then that it remains compromised um, it also uh, the time that people say to change passwords and we we would say every three months is probably um, the right the right number for a standard client um, it's designed around you know a, 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 a dictionary attack from a computer like it goes, attacks over and over again um, uh, would take maybe three months to finally go through all the different combinations. So if you're changing it every three months, you're sort of staying ahead of that game. That's kind of a theoretical idea, but I just think in general, changing passwords regularly um, is important um, because you know I know I have clients where the the e, everyone knows the ED's password and it because it hasn't changed in in eight years. And you know, at various points, I mean, the ED has been away for the day and needs someone to log into their desktop to get an important file they saved on their desktop, and they they tell somebody, and it never changes after that. And you know, it's just not good practice. Two-factor authentication. I don't think this is new to anybody. This idea that um, ideally, when possible, you'd have systems where you you have a password, but also maybe there's um, some sort of authenticator that creates a uh, another simple pin code or something on your mobile device, or maybe a, a text message is sent to your mobile device. We we employ this on our encrypted password database um, because that the, the, the our clients' passwords are in there, and it's very important to us to have the best security around that. So I can't log into that password database without not only putting in a complex password that changes every three months and so forth and so on, but I also then have to put in um, a code that is changed every um, every 30 seconds or, or 60 seconds or whatever on my phone. And the last thing about passwords is that just to, 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 to mention that, that um, identity and access management is... Um, Coming on, I mean, it's it's still sort of in uh, in a maturing phase, but this uh, particularly when you have so much more now in the cloud, and different um, your staff are logging into serve not just into your domain anymore, but they're logging into a multi multiple services that are owned by by your organization, whether it's HR systems or financial systems or email systems or file file systems. They're all out there on the cloud, and it's difficult for users to manage lots of different passwords. Um, there's uh, obviously um, a temptation to keep your passwords simple or use the same one over and over again. Um, and then, if you ever, that then of course discourages ever changing them because then you have to figure out, oh, did I change this one or not? I can't remember, so I, I'm going to write them down, which is not so great. Um, so, identity and access management. The idea is that you have a single service, and we've seen this at the at the single user level. I have LastPass, for example, at the consumer product for my own personal use. Where once I log into LastPass, I can then access all the other um, passwords that I use um, from there. Um, but if you have something like Okta, there's also um, that's a big name that that we've employed at 
deployed at some clients. Microsoft just released uh, nonprofit pricing for, for their um, EMS service, which includes Azure AD Premium, so they're getting into this game as well. Um, but this idea that the organization can own an identity and access management system where the user logs into that and from there gets access to everything else. So they get the, the benefit of having one password to rule them all, so to speak, but you get the benefit of seeing reporting and, um, and, and, and logging on, okay, this person's logged in, once they've logged into this service, what services have they accessed from there? Um, you can, you can if, if you onboard a new employee, you can quickly uh, give them access to the services you want to give access to and not to, to the other services. Um, you get the idea. I, uh, I don't want to spend much more time talking about it because, again, it's still sort of um, uh, a, a, an area that we're gaining our own, getting our own um, grasp of. And I think that the, the landscape is changing like month to month on this. I think the Microsoft nonprofit pricing for EMS might have come out, what, Matt, just in the last month, maybe two mm -hmm. months that it came out? Yeah. No, it's um, really so true. this is, everything's just changing all the time. But you should sort of, if you're, if you're in a position where this is something you're in charge of at your organization, should be thinking about the fact that, you know, sometime in the near future, me, um, medium term future, this is the kind of thing that you'll probably want to be looking at. Um, so even though we've been um, kind of bashing on antivirus and signature-based uh, detection, uh, you know it, it is 30 to 50 percent effective, which means it's <laughs> it's actually gonna it's catching some some stuff. Um, and you know the way that that uh, antivirus software has historically worked has basically been you know based on a definition list of, of definition list of bad software. And we've seen earlier in the presentation how how easy it is for uh, you know, for that software to be obfuscated. So it's not that hard to take a piece of known bad software, run it through a cryptor, change it, change the hash, and then boom, all of a sudden, uh, it's it's a new, essentially a new piece of software that that isn't on any software definition. So, uh, so that's how this uh, antivirus works. You know, it requires the full system scan. Uh, that's certainly a you know complaint that, that we get. Hey, you know, my computer has to run the scan every day or every week. Uh, and we still recommend doing it because those full scans do detect stuff uh, as new definitions are delivered, and it can detect things that may have been resident on a computer for uh, you know for some for some time. You know, and the other downside with uh, you know with antiviruses, you know, you need to keep adding definition files. The software keeps getting bigger because it needs to have more kind of sophistication uh, to do all this detection, and so uh, it's. Uh, uh, it, it continues to be, I think, fighting uh, a losing battle. The good news is, is that uh, uh, there are a number of kind of quote unquote next generation solutions that are really based off of uh, you know machine learning and big data kind of put to use. So here's an example I think of where we're really seeing you know kind of this cloud-based uh, data gathering and, and analytics um, being put to use. So instead of a static list of uh, kind of known bad files, uh, new antivirus um, tools like um, you know are, are gathering information from all the endpoints that that it's managing. Uh, that's being kind of fed back in a sent you know to the main uh, you know kind of data analytics engine, uh, and that you know the file hash information, the heuristics of that file uh, are being analyzed, and then that information is sent back. Uh, to the to the client to to help improve the detection of various processes. So uh, so that's on the uh, the kind of the desktop antivirus you know kind of file system process. The other uh, thing that we're seeing uh, I think is a great kind of fit into this kind of at the top of that pyramid uh, is around DN DNS filtering uh, and insight. And so that's where uh, you know Open DNS uh, comes in. Uh, we've been using them for, for a few months now, uh, and they fill that niche where it's addressing, you know, the fact that a lot of these threats are being delivered uh, through uh, malware, you know, advertising sites or, or kind of compromised websites. Uh, and so what that system allows you to do is, uh, as you click on a link, you know, that you're doing a DNS query, uh, and 
OpenDNS is is able to kind of do big data analytics to say, you know, is the site that you're going to, uh, does that contain any any kind of compromise or any um, you know, malicious activity, and if it does, it can be simply blocked, so you don't even get to the site in the first place. And so I think that's the new, you know, the new world. It's really, you know, prevent uh, is the new is the new contain. So you don't want to necessarily even get the antivirus or get the virus on your computer in the first place. You want to prevent that from even being uh, delivered. So and then, that, sorry. So just tagging on to that. So the idea here is again, this is only possible sort of with a cloud service where there's, you know, thousands if not millions of nodes that are constantly analyzing the traffic that's that's being queried and um, and sort of and, and then constantly updating the, the 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 DNS query tables saying this is no good, this is good. The nice thing about it is since it is a cloud service, unlike sort of filtering applications that used to run sort of on a device at your firewall or something, it's not heavy. It's it's all done without sort of impacting the performance of your network, um, really at all. I mean, it's it's. I don't think it has. Theoretically, there should be a small impact on performance, but I, it's it's just a theoretical one. I mean, it's milliseconds on each on each query to have an extra, an, an extra thing. Um, so it's it's the the flip side of the fact that that. The cloud makes all this criminal behavior easy. It it it, it makes some of the solutions more possible as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And I think the the final thing we have on here is just the reporting and analytics, and it's the ability I think to have that uh, insight into you know who's doing what, uh, what's going on, uh, and how might that represent a threat. So uh, so. We uh, are using um, Azure Active Directory Premium, which includes some reporting uh, and analytics. And so it's interesting, over the Christmas holidays, I was getting uh, email updates from that system that said, hey, we're noticing some you know, anomalous logins on your system. Uh, and so I was able to, to get that information, and I was able to check with my colleagues to say, hey, uh, I got a note that you were logging in from Chicago. Like, you usually you know, log in from Connecticut. Like, what's going on? And so we were able to say, oh, well, I was at my brother-in-law's house and logged in from there. Uh, and then kind of in that same vein, you know, got a, got a note from uh, you know, a user logged in in California, you know, 20 hours later that same login was in Japan. And, you know, looking at that report, I knew that, uh, you know, that that was a known event because that person was going on, you know, going to Japan for vacation. And so uh, it's it's that type of insight and analytics that's really made possible by uh, this move and, and uh, you know, capacity of, of the cloud infrastructure. So, um, I th so I think you know as much as yes, there's there's all these new uh, and pretty scary threats out there. Uh, I think there's a lot of confidence in some of these next generation uh, solutions that will be able to to really support the the end user security training and awareness to improve the overall security uh, at the you know at your organization. Right, and it really has to do with that machine learning. I mean, we it's always been possible to watch a log on log. And see what IPs people are logging on from. I mean, you can you we do that. Servers do that now. It's just who can read those logs. No, I mean, anyone can read them. Who's going to read them day after day to look for anomalous log anomalous logons? It's just not possible to to put that kind of time in. But if you can have um, you know machine learning that can can you know somehow figure out what kinds of things are interesting and what kind of things are not. And and present that to someone who can then act act on it. That's really helpful, um, and it's and it seems to work. I mean, it's, at least it's mm -hmm. worked in the cases that Matt just Matt just talked about. Yeah, great. Well, so we have uh, I guess a few minutes left here uh, to handle some questions. So uh, kind of as a follow on, so next month uh, we'll be having a specific. Uh, series on backup and disaster recovery for nonprofits, where we'll dig a little bit deeper into that topic. So hopefully, uh, you can join us uh, for that. Uh, and now, Johan, are there um, kind of any additional questions that we can address here in the next uh, next couple of minutes? Yes, there are. And <laughs> the most common question is whether or not this uh, webinar is going to be available. Uh, either the slides and or the recording, and it is, and I'm about to send the link out 
um, as a message through GoToWebinar. So you can bookmark that. It's our webinars page on our website. We tend to post the slides and the recording uh, within a week, usually within a couple business days, and we'll see what the how the snowstorm impacts us here in DC, but those should be up by Monday. Um, secondly, I wanted to just uh, give a big thanks to our one of our partners, OpenDNS. Many of the slides in today's presentation came from a presentation that, that they've put together that they make available to their partners, and we started working with them last year. Uh, so I want to acknowledge that. And also, um, once again, acknowledge Idealware, and um, their report is available for free, so I'd encourage you to go to their site to download it um, and take a look at it. It's an excellent report. We actually are one of the sponsors of the report, and we did that because um, the quality of their uh, reports is always very, very good, and um, security needs to be a priority for the nonprofit sector, so we were really honored to be a sponsor of that report. Um, so that being said, let's get to the questions here. Um, so you talked a little bit about uh, two-factor authentication and that Microsoft is now starting to um, build in or bake in some of these um, new, more sophisticated security measures into their solutions, whether it's identity management being built into Office 365 or two-factor being built into Windows 10. Uh, what's your sense of, you know, is that ready for prime time? Is that something that we, that you know, organizations should start to implement, or is it one of those Microsoft technologies that will, it'll definitely be ready a year from now, maybe six months from now? Um, I think on the the two-factor front, um, so certainly for any of their uh, kind of cloud cloud-based logins, uh, you know, you can turn on two-factor uh, and it's fairly straightforward. So any Microsoft ID account, uh, you can, you know, have that setting. Uh, supposedly in uh, Windows 10, we saw it demoed at the Ignite conference, uh, you'll be able to, to do kind of facial ID log, you know, recognition uh, and, and log into your Windows 10 computer. Uh, I have not actually seen that implemented yet. Uh, I think they're still actually sorting out some of the hardware requirements, but uh, that should be coming soon. So I think, uh, you know, it it's a big deal for Microsoft, and I think it should be ready sooner rather than later. Okay. What what about the um, the the new pricing on their Azure Premium um, service? Yes. So so Microsoft is. Has has had a product called uh, EMS that includes uh, a a bunch of a bunch of things. So uh, one of them being Azure Active Directory Premium, uh, which is their uh, gives you their ability to to do kind of single sign on and integration with third party apps, uh, and then also do things like password right back if you are doing um, you know that password synchronization if you have an act, on premise Active Directory. So it used to be that it was like $6 per license per user. Now it's $1.65, which certainly makes it a lot more appealing. Um, the the holdup that we've always seen with it is just, uh, it really is an enterprise level product uh, designed for you know organizations with more than 3,000 people. And so the implementation is a lot more sophisticated than you know some of the other single sign-on vendors like Okta or One Login, and so uh, so that's it remains to be seen if if a dollar sixty-five will be a good a good deal in the long term, um, or you know if if it you know is still going to be worth maybe paying a, a little bit more to have a simpler implementation you know with with some of these other solutions. So, uh, but I think it's definitely worth something. Uh, you know, we'll we'll be exploring it a lot more seriously now that the the pricing is um, you know a lot. A lot better. Great. Um, we have a we have a lot of questions, so I'm just going to go through them um, as quickly as we can, but as thoroughly as we can. Um, so, Steve, did you mention that mobile passwords should be about six characters in length? And if so, um, why would that why would it be acceptable to have shorter pass mobile passwords than um, you know for other types of accounts where you know eight, ten, twelve tends to be the, the minimum requirement. Yeah, I think the theory on that, um, and I got you know this this uh, notion came from um, from a psychotic, I guess, which which is who makes the Secret Server, which is the product we use for our um, 
password database for our clients, and they're, they, we really like them and, and think highly of their work. Um, I think the notion there is that um, a mobile device is, in a sense, two-factor authentication. You have to have the mobile device, and you have to know the six digits to get into the mobile device. And so those two things together create um, a, hi a higher bar to, to compromise than something like a domain password, which um, can work on sort of any machine and therefore is easier to, um, to try to um, compromise, you know, at a distance from, from somewhere else. So does that make sense? I don't want to belabor it too much. Yeah, I mean, so basically, just to see, make sure I understand, you know, with with cloud passwords, software as a service passwords, or domain passwords, there's the possibility of massive combinatorial attacks, where you know, brute force attack, where you're just trying lots of combinations of characters and numbers, and the from anywhere, from anywhere, you can do it from anywhere, and so you, in theory, have all the time in the world, and right. so the longer you make that string of characters, the more time is required. Whereas with a mobile device. You only have, you know, uh, supposedly. Until it's missed. Yeah, right. Exactly. Assuming and at you're which able point, to wipe hopefully it, you or, can wipe it exactly, exactly. Or change the password. Yeah. Okay. Yep. That makes sense. Um, any recommendations? So actually, I'm going to combine two questions. So, um, you know, we went through the security playbook uh, in terms of our, you know, our approach for the best way to have sort of defense in depth, you know, layered security approach. Uh, there were some questions about specific solutions that we recommend, and so one one question was, you know, are there security products that we recommend as part of our playbook? And then another question of uh, around anti-spam: is there an anti-spam solution specifically that we're recommending? Um, I mean, there's lots and lots of different um, security tools out there, and so I mean, I, I don't want to necessarily kind of give blanket endorsements. Um, you know, so I, as mentioned, you know, I think OpenDNS, I think, has done a good job of uh, filling, you know, a specific uh, niche regards to the DNS filtering. Um, you know, so anyways, there, yeah, there's there's a lot of different options out there. I think any again on any spam, uh, you know, there there are there are, you know a number of a different you know kind of op vendors that are out there, and I I think you know in general they're you know they're doing. If I could speak to if I could speak to any spam, and I think this was an, uh, a question that um, was sent to us ahead of this webinar as part of the registration process, sort of that balance between, you know, security and accessibility, which is the age-old question. I think with any spam, um, there, you know, we over the years we've seen any spam get better at at differentiating good from bad, um, and that's great. But um, and 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 so. If there was, some, if someone came out with like a new paradigm that just made it so much better, we'd all switch to it. But I think you know, pretty soon the different vendors sort of pick up on. It's just like antivirus; they all sort of pick up on the same theory and apply it. Um, with anti spam, it's that age-old compromise between too many false positives um, and and making sure you get all the the bad stuff, and and that's that is its own pain point where you didn't get the email you should have, the legitimate email you should have, because something something triggered um, um, uh, a a a, blank, a a block um, because you turned up the dial too much. So I, that's the that to me is the challenge with anti spam, which is why we don't turn up the dial all the way. And so we don't block all spam, but then you know some spam gets through, but that but otherwise we're afraid of of blocking things. Do you want to talk about the antivirus shift that we're making, Matt, or is that still sort of in development? I'm not giving you much well, choice actually, to say no. Before before I'll give Matt a chance to think about about that. <laughs> uh, you're putting him on the spot. Um, one other thing I would add about anti-spam, just to kind of talk a little bit about where we have seen the industry moving. Um, up until, you know, three years ago, we were big fans of Postini. And I think Postini was really the first and best solution that, you know, back in the mid-2000s took anti-spam into the cloud. And it was kind of one of the first, you know, we're going to solve security through machine learning, um, through aggregating vast amounts of data. And not surprisingly, 
Google acquired them. That's very much in Google's wheelhouse. Uh, Google then took the technology and, as far as we know, incorporated it into Gmail and then shut down Postini. So that was very uh, unfortunate for all of us who used Postini and, and for staff who really got used to that solution. Um, so we and many of, of other organizations that we work with switched to um, McAfee, which was uh, which had acquired MX Logic. McAfee was then purchased by Intel. Intel just announced at the end of last year that they're shutting down McAfee. Um, so, you know, I don't want to read too much into all of that, but our sense is that there's a lot of industry consolidation happening now with anti-spam, and I think to the extent that. Um, email is is by and large moving out to the cloud and generally moving to either Google Apps or Office 365. That we may see, you know, spam just becoming uh, completely baked in with with those two solutions rather than being as a a separate standalone product. There are still third-party anti-spam solutions out there, and in many cases they provide a layer of protection that Google and and Microsoft can't. Um, but it's uh, you know, it's it's hard to tell exactly where that's all going. So th that's another that's just an all of that to say. It's another factor to keep in mind um, because switching anti-spam solutions uh, can be difficult for end users to to adjust to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a a good assessment. I actually just got off a, a vendor call earlier today with you know, kind of talking about our plan to. Move to a a, a new uh, in, you know spam filtering solution, and so uh, you know we'll be you know, kind of starting that planning process as well. Uh, you know, and with regards to you know antivirus, yeah, we are in the process of um, finally uh, finalizing our migration plan. You know, from a traditional signature-based plan, uh, you know that that I think has has been a solid solution over the years to one of these next-generation um, you know cloud. Analytics-driven solutions. You know that's going to be you know one one piece of our overall security um, you know playbook that that we have with our clients. So great. Um, uh, let's see. So um, are there any differences between the secure the threat landscape, uh, the security issues that are out there? the overall strategy for dealing with them and concerns, is there any difference between what nonprofits face specifically and what for-profit organizations, particularly small and medium-sized businesses, face? I'd argue not much. I think, um, I think there are probably specific businesses and specific nonprofits that may um, may actually be vulnerable to targeted attacks in the in the old sense of like being picked out you know um, because of who they are whether you're a nonprofit that does a particular kind of advocacy that's not popular with some um, parts of the general population or a business that you know for whatever reason uh, antagonizes you know a customer that happens to be you know have uh, you know capacity in this in this area but I mean I think if in terms of like the 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 non-targeted you know like crime of opportunity that I think is more of the threat that most of our clients face I think what makes you vulnerable is having an IP address on the internet which all of us have to have and to have computers that can uh, be used to you know, do bad things as you know, bots or or um, deliver malware or what have you. Um, and I I don't think I don't think that um, that nonprofits are more or less vulnerable to for profits. Um, I I'd I'd say particularly in the small and medium business sphere, I don't think that nonprofits are worse off though either. I don't think I mean I think big corporations have you know the have the wherewithal and also the um, have have the history to to sort of focus on this, and they may have you know chief security officer and so on, but I don't think um, you know s smaller nonprofits have have been able to focus on this issue much, um, and I don't think small and medium businesses have have either. So I think you know everyone needs to play catch up here. Matt, do you have any? What do you mm -hmm. think? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, there's there's probably not much differentiation in that you know, kind of in that SMB space. So organizations, you know, under uh, you know, 300 people, whether they they be you know, kind of a for-profit business or uh, or a nonprofit. Um, you know, I think to some extent, nonprofits may have a leg up in that there's you know, quite a few donation programs that that help. You know, like Office 365, you know, is is you know free for nonprofits for email and uh, you know and, and SharePoint, and so you know if you can get into that, you're going to be kind of in a much better place than you know a, a similarly sized for-profit business that has to spend you know twenty dollars a month for the same thing. So um, yeah, but in terms of a practical uh, difference, uh, I don't think there is much of one. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's good to know. Um, going back to uh, the anti-spam question uh, really quick, especially with regards to McAfee going away, um, any thoughts about relying on Forefront? Um, one of the features that you know McAfee provided beyond just anti-spam was being able to queue email in the event that the mail server, primary mail server, went down. Do you feel like that's, I mean, obviously when we had on-premise mail servers, that was important to have. What's your sense of the need for that uh, in, if, if everyone's moving to either Office 365 or Google Apps? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think, you know, that, that mail queuing or uh, feature was, was really important whenever you had an on-premise mail server. And, you know, it was not unrealistic to expect, you know, the power to be out in your building for a weekend while they did maintenance. And, you know, that would take down email. Um, you know, but with Office 365 or Google Apps, you know, yes, there might be a brief outage, uh, you know, measured in hours, uh, but um, yeah, but I think the 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 business need to have you know a, an extra layer in front and assume that that solution is going to be up more than more than Microsoft or Google. Uh, you know, I think that that need just isn't there. So if you still have an on-premise uh, server. You know your your business uptime is is not going to be as good as you know kind of a cloud you know Office 365 Google Apps uh, and so you may have that need um, but if you're in Office 365 or Google Apps uh, I think that that need for a business continuity email solution just just isn't as relevant. Um, we have a great question kind of coming in from the training angle. Are there any resources that provide a sort of good real time summary? of developments in social engineering. So you had mentioned earlier, Steve, you know, some of the new uh, advanced techniques like the FedEx package scam. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, you know I, I guess like the Nigerian Prince scam is still around, but it's become such a uh, artifact of urban legend, you know, that it's probably not as effective as it was when it first came out, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, are there resources that can provide like a good uh, sort of update on what's happening in the world of social engineering that IT staff can share with their users to kind of keep them up to date on the latest schemes or threats to be um, on the lookout for? I don't have an answer in my pocket. Matt? Yeah, I mean, I know that there, there are a number of vendors uh, that focus specifically on uh, email, uh, email Kind of penetration testing, and then followed up with training. So one of those vendors is, uh, I think it's called Wombat. Uh, we've had a few clients take advantage of that. Then uh, basically, what that does, or what that system does, is you kind of upload a list of your uh, your users, uh, and then the Wombat system will start sending, you know, over a period of whatever a week or so, uh, you know, kind of a range of of uh, of you know emails with different you know different types of content. Uh, and then, so as an admin, you'll get reports that says, you know, hey, your your staff are really susceptible to, you know, the FedEx mail tracking link. You know, 20%, you know, clicked on that link, and here's here's a web-based training to show them that they can go through to, uh, you know, improve their awareness. Um, and then you can even test your own kind of current spam system that said, oh, well, you know. 85% of all the messages were, were blocked uh, and never delivered. Uh, so, th so there are tools, you know, like Wombat that will give some, you know, more specifics and follow-up in terms of what, you know, 
either what types uh, of messages are most appealing uh, to your users or even you know what groups of staff like hey your senior researchers are really gullible and they you know they clicked on uh, you know malicious email at a higher rate than the interns did so there are tools like that um, uh, that are out there I'm in terms of specifics like you know, like a blog or, that lists, right. you know, the, the latest, greatest. I don't know of any. I bet I there's mean, something Krebs, out there. I mean, Krebs on security, and you will you saw that link throughout some of the, the, the pictures, is a really great kind of security-centric blog with, you know, kind of recent, you know, threats. And uh, so I think that's a good thing just to read to kind of keep, if you want to kind of keep up with what's going on in the world of security. Um, it's, it's a little bit broader than, you know, specific social engineering uh, advances or changes. Great. All right. Well, that that concludes the webinar. That concludes the questions. Uh, this was a very informative and uh, interesting look at the latest in IT security. It's going to be a priority for us here at Community IT throughout the course of 2016. And so we encourage you to stay connected with us. Um, We'll be posting updates on our blog related to IT security. We have some additional webinars planned uh, as the year goes on related to IT security, including the one next month where we talk about backups and disaster recovery. Um, we will be sending a, a short survey, or actually it'll pop up after, as you exit the webinar, and your feedback is very important to the continued development of these webinars. So any feedback you can provide is greatly appreciated. If you missed anything, we will also email you a link to the slides and recording, and I've been chatting and tweeting those out today. Uh, you can connect with us on Twitter, uh, Google+, Plus, if anyone still uses that. Um, our Facebook page is kept up to date, as is our LinkedIn um, page, so I encourage you to connect with us on social media. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this month, and we look forward to seeing you again having you join us next month on February 18th. Until then, have a great month. Take care. Thank you. You still broadcasting? I, I had a few, actually had a few more questions to uh, that came in right at the end, and I just wanted to make sure I address. So this is the bonus track on today's <laughs> webinar. <laughs> Steve, you got the guitar? <laughs> a little encore. <laughs>